Leviticus 18.22 strongly condemns and prohibits homosexual activity even if such activity is between consenting adults in a loving relationship. According to the scholar Roy Gain, the language of this verse is, quote, devastatingly untechnical, leaving no room for ambiguity. One does not have to like this verse or agree with it, but that does not change what it says. Why do I point this out? Well, because in recent days, progressive Christians have claimed that Leviticus 18.22 does not mean what it plainly says. I want to address their objections in this video. Objection 1. Leviticus 18.22 condemns homosexual acts only in the context of idolatry and temple prostitution. Reverend Brandon Robertson has argued that the Bible does not condemn homosexual behavior as morally wrong per se. It is condemned only in its association with pagan fertility cults, as Robertson explains. Leviticus 18.22 is a condemnation of temple prostitution not loving same-sex relationships. This is what it's about. It's a prohibition of engaging in sexual sacrifices to honor gods and goddesses. It's not a prohibition of loving, committed, same-sex relationships. Robertson supports this conclusion by noting that Leviticus 18.22 directly follows the commandment against sacrificing one's child to Moloch. Robertson also notes the warnings against practicing the abominable customs of the Canaanites at the beginning and end of the chapter. Thus, according to Robertson, homosexual behavior is condemned only as part of these idolatrous practices. However, as Dr. Robert Gagnon writes, quote, few today give this argument much credence and for good reason. One of the problems with Brandon Robertson's argument is when the commandment against homosexual behavior is repeated in Leviticus 20.13, it occurs in the midst of the prohibitions against incest, bestiality, and adultery. This context would indicate that homosexual behavior, like incest and adultery, is condemned as a sexual violation in nature. It is not condemned merely in its connection with pagan cultic practices. It is true that the warnings against practicing Canaanite customs frame the sexual prohibitions given in Leviticus 18, but to suggest that homosexual behavior is condemned only because it is connected with paganism is misreading the text. We don't try to limit the other sexual prohibitions found on Leviticus 18 to this context, so it would be entirely inconsistent to do so with the prohibition against homosexual behavior. Even scholars who affirm same-sex relationships, like Gerald Shepard, acknowledge this fact, as Shepard writes, quote, I do not think that the text in Leviticus can be read from a historical perspective as applicable only to cult prostitution because they stand in the context of other laws regulating general immoral conduct, such as incestuous relationships, adultery, and bestiality. Indeed, there is no reason to interpret Leviticus 18.22 as prohibiting homosexual behavior only in a cultic context and not outside of such context. If this verse were intended to prohibit homosexual behavior only within the context of cult prostitution, the author could have easily made that clear by explicitly referencing the cult prostitute in the text as we see elsewhere in the Torah. The fact that he does not do this indicates a broader application of the law. Objection 2. Leviticus 18.22 condemns only homosexual rape, not homosexual activity between consenting participants. Another objection to the straightforward reading of Leviticus 18.22 is to say that the verse intends to condemn only same-sex rape, not homosexual activity per se. As Adam Hamilton writes, quote, It is worth noting that the story of the attempted gang rape in Sodom is the only example of same-sex sexual activity activity in the Torah up to this point. Could this have been the backdrop to Leviticus 18.22 and 2013? Given that this is the only occurrence of a man lying with a man, is it at least possible that Leviticus 18.22 and 2013 were condemning homosexual rape rather than anything approximating two people sharing their lives in a loving relationship? The answer to Hamilton's question is no. There are a few reasons we know that the aim of Leviticus 18.22 is to prohibit consensual homosexual activity generally. First, according to Leviticus 2013, both participants in the act are to be punished. As Richard Davidson writes, quote, unlike other ancient Near Eastern laws relating to homosexual activity, both parties here are penalized, thus clearly implying consensual male-male intercourse, not just a case of homosexual rape. If this verse were prohibiting rape, then it does not make sense that the victim should be punished. When the Torah addresses rape elsewhere, only the rapist is to be punished. Second, if Leviticus 18.22 intended to prohibit only homosexual rape, we would expect 
the text to be explicit about this qualification, as we see with other ancient Near Eastern legislation governing homosexual activity. However, the absoluteness of the Torah's prohibitions against homosexual behavior is, quote, unlike anything else found in the ancient Near East or Greece. Contexts that make accommodations depending on active role, consent, age, or social status of the passive partner, alien slave foreigner, and or cultic association. The idea that only homosexual rape is being condemned in Leviticus 18.22 seems to be something that is read into the text instead of naturally gleaned from the text. Third, the suggestion that Leviticus 18.22 condemns only homosexual rape does not make sense contextually. None of the other prohibitions in Leviticus 18 are limited to oppressive forms of those sexual relationships. To assert that Leviticus 18.22 and 2013 prohibit only homosexual rape is like insisting that Leviticus 18.20 and 2010 prohibit only coercive forms of adultery. The homosexual act itself is what is being condemned, just as adultery itself is what is being condemned. In conclusion, attempts to limit the application of Leviticus 18.22 to a pagan cultic context fail contextually and logically. Leviticus 2013 clarifies that the act is condemned as a general sexual violation, it is not condemned merely as part of cultic practices. Moreover, it is inconsistent to restrict the validity of this commandment to a pagan cultic context and not to do the same with other commandments found in the same context, incest, adultery, etc. Finally, the fact that the author does not explicitly limit the application of the commandment to such a cultic context when he easily could have done so indicates that the command has a broader application. Attempts to suggest that Leviticus 18.22 condemns only homosexual rape fail because Leviticus 20.13 punishes both participants, whereas in cases of rape, only the rapist is to be punished. Moreover, unlike other ancient Near Eastern law codes, the language of Leviticus 18.22 is absolute and without qualification. Finally, the suggestion that Leviticus 18.22 prohibits only homosexual rape does not make sense contextually as none of the other prohibitions in Leviticus 18 are so limited in their scope. When the author prohibits adultery, he is not prohibiting only one type of adultery in which the woman was coerced. Similarly, we have no reason to think that the prohibition against homosexual behavior is about rape. Leviticus 18.22 is unambiguous and straightforward in its condemnation of homosexual activity. Hey, I hope you were blessed by this video, and I'll see you next time. Hey, everyone. Everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If you did like it, consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing your thoughts in the comments below. Also, if you want to see more content like this, I want to invite you to subscribe to my channel. You can also hit that little bell so that you'll be notified when new videos like this are released. I'll see you next time. Blessings and Shalom.